Um, first of all, I'd like to reiterate the thanks for Trade Me for providing the venue. Uh, as I understand, we couldn't have done it without you, so thank you a lot. Uh, Octopus Deploy as well, thank you so much for bringing the food. Uh, we could probably have done it without you, but everyone would be really hangry, so we wouldn't have gone with us. Uh, so thank you for that. And thanks Product Tank as well. Uh, Anthony and the, the team of volunteers who've made this happen. Uh, really good quality events all year. Um, I've been coming to these things for seven years now, so uh, first time caller, long time listener. Um, <laughs> and uh, we'll kick it off. So what we're gonna talk about today is um, how things are a little bit different at Hectare than uh, Michael and I have found them at previous companies. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a few different aspects of Hectare that make it interesting. Um, one of them is enterprise customers. Uh, Hands up if you've done this enterprise before. Yeah, it's a bit different, eh? Wow, lots of you have. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, also, we're serving agricultural customers. So that means uh, in the field, it means rain, it means sun, uh, it means unskilled labor, and it means customers who really don't care about tech except for what it can do for them. Uh, so that's another aspect. We're also a startup, so severely resource constrained. We don't have you know, data, product ops, we don't have uh, design research, so we have to do a lot of the stuff ourselves. So that's a bit of a, a, a spoiler of what we're going to talk about today. I am going to introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Aaron Croft. Uh, I've been at Hector for about nine months. Um, before that, I've held a whole bunch of other product roles, uh, usually in AI and ML uh, product management. Uh, spent a bit of time at Zero. Uh, I recognize a few faces in the crowd. I think it's kind of a, a you know a badge of honor for for product folks to be a part of Zero and then to leave. Um, and um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, so also a dad, I've got two kids, one's four, one's one, and I'm into board games. I'm going to kick it over to Michael. Uh, hi, how's it going? I'm Michael. So I've been in New Zealand about five and a half years, five of which I also worked at Zero, uh, where I met Aaron and Saggy and a few other people that are in the crowd here. <laughs> um, and I spent the other six months at Hector, so quite fresh still. Um, before that, I was in Dublin working in agencies, working with a lot of fintech and insurance clients, things like that. Um, and yeah, not a real dad, dog dad. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah, I don't care who says otherwise. Um, and yeah, not really the same thing. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's pretty much me. Great to be here. Cool. And I'm going to talk about our purpose. So um, probably most of you haven't heard of Hector at all. So can I get a show of hands? Who's heard of Hector at least? There's a good few of you, maybe 30 percent. So. Uh, I'll talk about what we what we aspire to first. Um, so some of you probably don't know, uh, from the time a, a fruit starts growing on a tree to the time it ends up in your fruit bowl, uh, like 30 to 40% of that fruit is wasted, uh, which is such a big shame. Um, and it can be lost uh, with pests and fungus while it's on the tree. Uh, it can be lost by people damaging the fruit as they're picking it. Uh, it can be lost in logistics between the, the orchard and the, the pack house where it's packed into boxes. It can be stored for too long and it can go off then it's another shipping thing to the supermarket, uh, and then not all of it sells as well. So 30, 40, 30 to 40% of fruit gets lost. And basically what we do is we provide data services uh, to help growers and packers and everyone in the supply chain make better decisions so less fruit is lost. That's what we do. How do we do it? We have one product called Spectre. Um, Spectre is uh, something which allows you to get a size distribution and a color distribution of the fruit. Uh, first of all, we started in a bin with a mobile phone. So you pull out the phone, you take a photo of the bin, and it gives you the size of all this top, the fruit in the top of the bin. And it takes a statistical sample of, of the rest of the bin um, and so on. And more recently, we have gone into this top-down product. Um, you can see here a cherry bin going underneath the camera. Uh, usually it's a, a truck with, um, say, 90 bins of apples and they all go underneath the camera. We take a video of all of the different bins on top and get a huge sample, sometimes up to 9,000 apples, uh, and get the size and color distributions of those fruit. And then pack houses can make decisions about where to store that fruit, and when they pull the fruit out of the room, they know what fruit they're gonna pack, which means they can fulfill their sales better, which means they lose less fruit. So it's one of our products. Kick over to Michael for the other one. Mm. So the other side of our company is the orchard management software. Basically, it's the same as any other workforce management tool, except it is really well tailored for orchards. So orchards are treated very differently to other um, companies. They obviously care about you know how many apples people are picking or how many cherries people are picking. And a lot of the, the customer, a lot of the, the employees are paid based on how much they pick. 
So we track um, how many bins or cherry logs they're actually picking. And then we do other things like, you know, have the digital timesheets for them to save time for supervisors and managers. And mm -hmm. um, we integrate with lots of payroll systems. We do things like quality control um, insights, cost analysis, things like that. Um, so it is really the end-to-end -end kind of workforce management tool. So what are we going to be talking about today? <laughs> so it's going to be quite triggering for a lot of you, so please don't leave. I know there's a bit of a no, no agenda, no attendance thing that's going around at the minute. Um, this talk will be more of a meandering journey. Um, we'll tell you a few stories, uh, make a few bad puns and bad jokes. Um, please stay, though. Um, <laughs> hopefully please. each story uh, will provide some insight into Hector and how we do things. Um, and how we're tackling problems. We aren't telling you it's necessarily the right way to do things or that uh, this is how you should do things, um, but it's more maybe a thought-provoking chat and maybe a conversation starter for some of you. Um, please don't be afraid to ask questions. Aaron really loves people who ask questions, so he'll be happy to answer anything that you might have um, and just put your hand up at any stage. Um, we don't have to wait till the end. Cool, back to Aaron. All right, controversially named first slide. Um, this is gonna be a bit different from other talks. I'm gonna require a bit of participation from you all. Hopefully you oblige, otherwise it's gonna be a pretty bad talk. Um, this one here, we're gonna talk about uh, a particular scenario that I faced when I joined Hectare. Uh, and I'm gonna throw it over to you, product managers uh, and other roles in the audience. Uh, and um, uh, I'm gonna ask you to make uh, a call Talk about the scenario. So basically, I started at Hectare, and like most people starting their first jobs, they think everything is broken. Um, and the question was, what do I invest my time into first? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the observations that I made, and I'm going to ask you to choose whether you would focus on strategy, discovery, or delivery. Uh, you will need to choose one. You will need to raise your hand at least once during this thing, hopefully. Um, and uh, we're going to put it to a vote. And it's going to be really interesting to see what mix of answers we get. So uh, here's the context. Okay, pay attention, you're going to need to vote. Um, the, on the strategy side, uh, we had uh, ambiguous customer and market segmentation and no competitive advantage identified in those segments, I thought. Uh, we had a misalignment between what the LT thought and the features that were being shipped. Um, and the SLT meetings were like, why are we shipping this feature? Um, and I guess kind of the corollary to that was uh, no revenue upside to the work in progress. Uh, for a startup, we depend on revenue. It drives our valuation. Um, so like, who's going to buy this was the, was the question. Um, and the connection was a little bit shady. So that's strategy. If you want to talk about strategy, save it up. Discovery. What I observed, product not speaking to customers. So CS and sales instead were talking to the customers, relaying the requests to product. Uh, and then product would use gut feel uh, prioritization. You guys are familiar with the gut feel prioritization framework? Cool. Um, and we had a single designer who wasn't involved in discovery, um, who was kind of taking PRDs and doing designs. So that was discovery. Uh, if you want to vote for discovery, save that up. And delivery, uh, we had a product owner role um, who would take the requests from the product manager, the feature requests, uh, think it through, think it through, and do product requirement documents which would then get handed over to design. Uh, maybe some of you can relate to this as well. Uh, and then engineering would kind of comment on the PID, you'd have an iterative process, and then the product owner would write all the tickets and then manage the delivery process. So that's the situation. Now it's over to you. You are the product manager at Hector, you just started, uh, and I need you to vote. So strategy, discovery, delivery, let's see how this goes. Who votes for strategy first? Yeah, we've got about, a quarter of the room, or maybe third, maybe 40%. Who votes for discovery? Yeah, good, I'm glad. Uh, and who votes for delivery? <coughs> Got a delivery, nice. <laughs> Two people for delivery. Okay, I think strategy won that, or oh, maybe discovery. I think it was pretty close between strategy and discovery, but we'll click on discovery. So this is gonna be like a choose your own adventure. Everyone knows like the Goosebumps books. I'm gonna read out what happened when you focused on discovery. So. Oh, <laughs> so here's what you did. Uh, you hired a designer called Michael, uh, and together with the pod lead, you spent a bunch of time visiting <laughs> visiting customers, doing generative research, mixing in evaluative research, testing your ideas early, and you've got a really good amount of confidence that the thing you want to ship next will solve the customer problem, 
uh, and make hectic money. Nice work. Unfortunately, your discovery was too focused on too focused on your top market segment so far, um, and a competitor who's been flying under the radar uh, with superior technology has started to take deals from you in that segment. So you realize that that direction is a dead end. I'm sorry. Uh, you at least hope for some cash from your efforts this season, um, but the team is shipping a six-month re-architecture, and that split focus has meant that it's not going to ship until the end of the Apple season, which is too late to get any cash this year. So you haven't shipped any value, and you lose your job. <laughs> That's not that bad. <laughs> OK, well, let's see your hands again. So strategy or delivery? Let's see which way you go at Discovery, folks. Strategy? OK. Delivery? Oh, more people at delivery this time. OK. We're going to go with strategy. Oh. <laughs> uh, so you definitely identify the most valuable market segment. Uh, you profile the competition, and you identify a radical yet innovative pathway to increase your market share and expand into a new market with a new distribution channel. Great work. Unfortunately, this took you six months, and in that time, the engineering team are mired in a six-month deep re-architecture of a feature for a customer that's not even in your target segment anymore, and it probably isn't even valuable to them anyway. Uh, and you haven't shipped any value, and you lose your job. So, uh, who were the delivery folks? Be honest. Yeah. Oh, sorry, everyone. So, uh, delivery. So you catch wind that the engineering team are working on a re-architecture, uh, one of your major features, and that's the main source of customer complaints uh, from your customer success team. Great. Uh, you know the season is coming up soon, so you work with engineering to drastically reduce the scope of that. Uh, then you implement a low-hanging fruit feature, low-hanging fruit feature that the VP, VP of Sales has promised you a will land him two major six-figure deals, and b everyone else also wants it. So. Great. Now, revenue is the focus, and Kevin is pretty trustworthy. So you interview a few internal stakeholders, you find out what the core problem is, and with some collective genius, you carve out a minimum lovable product, which is shipped in time for the Apple season. Great. Good job. Unfortunately, the two deals you were promised fell through, because it turns out they also need two other features. Um, and uh, you also find out that the customers also belong to a relatively small market segment, which doesn't scale to the rest of your customer base. Your uh, architecture scope reduction didn't actually solve the problem because it was a little bit more complicated than you thought, and you didn't ship any value and you lose your job. So, <laughs> um, I guess the point is you need to balance strategy, discovery, and delivery. Sometimes one person doesn't do all of them, but you need to make sure they're covered in your organization. If you neglect any, bad things will happen. And as we know, there's also the other stuff. Okay, yeah, that's okay. Oh! <laughs> you keep on top of everything at work, but unfortunately, since you're spending so much time there, you lose touch with all your friends, and your spouse accuses you of infidelity, <laughs> leading to a divorce and a painful custody battle for your kids. But at least you still got your job. So. <laughs> Everyone's recovered from that roller coaster of emotions. <laughs> Um, so this is me back in May when I joined Hector from Zero at BDI, and I really realized that I wasn't in Kansas anymore. Um, coming from a pretty large organization like Zero, and moving into a startup world um, has been obviously incredibly exciting and a brilliant change of pace. Um, but I definitely had some idealistic views of how the world of design and research is going to be at Hector. This was me uh, explaining to Aaron about all my plans and all the, the cool things I was going to do in the new... Um, things we're going to introduce but i wasn't quite aware of the challenges we would face in the ag tech um, industry um, and trying to do things the way you would do them at a large organization um, wouldn't quite work and also the industry specific um, challenges that we would have um, probably where i was a little bit ignorant of um, growers are obviously not the same as accountants um, and either are packers with pack houses um, and of course the challenges are made is what makes working at a startup and in the ag tech space um, so interesting. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some of those challenges um, and how we've either overcome them or adapted um, to live with them, I guess. All right. 
the first thing we had to get to grips with was, was understanding the industry language and being able to speak to the customers in a language that they understood. Um, previously, when conducting research and talking to customers, we've been able to you know, treat them as the expert and um, ask them seemingly silly questions, and they would mm -hmm. accept that because that's how research is done. Um, in ag tech, when visiting customers, there's an expectation that you know what you're talking about, that you're knowledgeable about the industry, um, that you're knowledgeable about their history with Hector, and um, you understand the industry in general and how you know how an apple is grown from a bud through to, to on the shelves of a shop. Luckily, Aaron had some experience in the in the industry working at Compaq before, and um, so he was able to shoulder some of that uh, pain initially, and I was able to ride on his coattails. Um, that's him having the conversation while I was standing um, <laughs> awkwardly in the corner. <clears throat> Another challenge that we had was um, kind of trying to break down some biases of us being the geeks coming down from the city um, and the, the kind of the idea that customers had in their head about us. Um, and being a product company, as you all know, um, you can't build every feature that your customer is asking for. Um, so this can, this can make some uh, interesting visits, I guess. Um, especially if customers feel like they haven't been heard or um, the, that they're, we're up in our nice warm office while they're in the cold in the field and, and dealing with some problems with the app. And also recruiting, well, research recruitment is always hard, as probably a lot of you know. Um, but this was a new level of difficulty, I guess. Um, we faced some radio silence when emailing participants. Um, and it's not something that we take personally. We're lovely people, and our emails were very nicely crafted. Um, but emails are not really monitored in the agricultural space. They're not sitting at a desk. They're not looking at their emails on a day-to-day basis. Um, and even if they did check their emails, the idea of jumping on a call with us and having a screen sharing session for an hour probably wasn't something that they really wanted to do. Um, we've all had emails even from big tech companies, and we've all ignored them. They're coming from the UX research uh, department. Um, it's very upsetting. Reply to those emails. Um, and setting up a video call just isn't something that they want to do with their time. So how do we combat these challenges? Well, first of all, we all leveled up our orchard and fruit growing knowledge. Um, and we visited as many customers as possible. Nothing beats actually being on site with a customer. You learn so much more than on a call, you know, hiding behind a screen. Um, you can see them in their environment, understand the pains, and see them using the app in real life. Um, and as a side effect of this, recruitment comes so much easier because they know who you are, they can put a face to the name, um, and you've been nice to them when you visited them. Um, leaning on your sales and CS team is such a good way of getting access to customers that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get access to. Um, they know them intimately, they talk to them every day or every week. Um, and we find that that has really, really helped with getting through to people. And if all else fails, just stick on some wellies or gumboots, as you guys call them, um, and give them a hand with picking or pruning or whatever the case may be. Um, there's a few of us actually flying to Otago tomorrow to, um, to go and visit a customer. So the benefits, I guess, are getting to visit some customers in some beautiful parts of the world. Um, and yeah. Back to Aaron, I guess, for some more interactivity. Yes, whether you like it or not. Um, so this one's going to be a little bit different. Uh, you're still the product manager, uh, but I'm going to take the role of the salesperson. Uh, and I'm going to articulate a scenario to you, and I'm going to give you three goes at asking questions for context. Um, so anyone can ask the question in your hive mind um, over there. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to vote whether we agree to the salesperson's demand or whether we refuse because we're product managers. <laughs> so um, this particular uh, situation, um, sales comes to you with a huge enterprise deal, huge. Um, but to close it, the customer just needs two features built first. And the question is, do you agree to build the features or do you refuse uh, and tell the customer to get and find another customer, um, as it were? So. Uh, this, the two features are, uh, one's an automation play. So what they want is they want to do, they don't want to do any data entry whatsoever. So there needs to be some sort of automation uh, which makes our Spectre camera do uh, its thing automatically. Uh, and the second one was they wanted us to uh, detect these different colored bins of fruit, uh, which are full of rubbish apples and not size those ones. So two feature requests. You have three questions and the runner helper is over there. Raise your hand if you want to ask. The question, don't worry, you won't lose your jobs. 
This is a completely safe environment. The outcome's already been determined. This is just <laughs> Any questions? I, I have the first the first question, and and this is not actually a question. Is is Rich Mironov in the room when you're asking this question? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> for anyone that knows Rich Mironov, he's a, he's a very well-known speaker in the B2B enterprise play, and this is what his a lot of his work is all about. You know, we're going to sell something, but if we just build those two features, we'll get that sale across the line. Anyway, I'll hand over to somebody who's actually got a real question. All right, Vishal here. So what's the value of delivering these features? So they can compare the value against what you're currently delivering. Good question. So the value of this feature is um, this particular customer uh, they have little tractors instead of trucks. And on each tractor, you've got about 20 bins max. Uh, and the tractors come in every 15 seconds or so. So they literally can't spend the time to enter the data in order to, um, you know, keep up with the, with the play. So it's either this or, or nothing. Relative to other things, um, we were prioritizing revenue at the time, and this was a big revenue opportunity. Big, huge. Any other questions? Two questions. Two more. Um, Andrew here, are these the only two features that they want to build or is there other features that they want to add on top of these? Those are the only two features that sales would admit that they wanted at the time. <laughs> but there's no guarantee. Uh, this is the last question for the hype mind. Uh, after this, you'll all need to make up your mind and either agree or refuse question how many other customers will use this feature uh, so um, that's actually part of the answer so I will address that but it's a very good question um, so let's go ahead and do the vote um, <laughs> we didn't know the answer to that at the time um, and um, if you refuse there's no guarantee that you're going to get your way anyway by the way but uh, who who votes to agree to build the two features a few people, yeah, you need the money, great, you know, about a quarter. Who says refuse? All right, good, good. <laughs> There's always new ones, you're right. I'm, I'm deliberately forcing you to choose. <laughs> well, it's a good question as well. <laughs> it's a harsh place to work, um, so there's a bit of danger. All right, so this is the one where Aaron agreed to build a big feature because a big customer asked for it. And most of you wouldn't have done it, so let me just defend myself. <laughs> and then tell Michael about it. Thanks, Michael. I'll send that letter. So this isn't going to be a good decision, bad decision thing, because in product you never really know whether you made the right decision. You kind of know whether you made a good decision or you know whether you made a bad decision, but you can't go back in time and be like, oh, I want to replay that except with building this other thing instead. So. We'll talk about how it panned out. So um, what did we do? We evaluated the requests against our strategy, which we hadn't finished yet. So it was like, what's our strategy going to be? Um, does it really fit with that ideal customer profile? Uh, to us, it did. Uh, does anyone else want it? Great question at the back there. Um, we needed to answer that question. Uh, what we did was we got four of our other big customers on the phone, uh, and we asked them to do a trial for that season. Uh, and because it involves some dev resource on their time, there's some skin in the game. So, you know, high level of validation. Um, does it play into our competitive advantage? It did. We wanted to become more automated, uh, reduce the amount of time and effort for our customers. And um, one of the requests, the bin one, didn't meet the threshold. So we said no to that one. It was the, you know, and thing. We refused one of them, but we agreed to do the other one. Um, and um, we when we designed the solution we made sure we had all four contexts of all four enterprise customers together before we designed the solution uh, and um, we rolled it out to three of those customers one of them we didn't even talk to but you know still it fit their solution so i don't know it became a paid upsell feature was it the right thing to do maybe maybe not we've still got that customer on the hook and it's a huge customer you need startup money i don't know i don't know what the real answer is but that's how it played out so thanks for participating what did you sacrifice in order to build that feature? Yeah, good question. What other work? There was other work on the roadmap. Don't repeat the questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, what did we sacrifice um, by doing that feature over other features? Uh, so we had uh, another feature in the pipe that had a business case that we thought was going to get us uh, some money, but not as much money as this feature was going to get because there was a promise of other customers in the region as well. Um, which you know maybe will or won't happen, but um, we did a, a business casing exercise uh, and chose the one that 
had the highest return for 2023 revenue, which was uh, our priority. Um, yeah. So does your customer uh, the question was, did the customer accept only getting one of two features? Um, yes, they did. Uh, we went back and we said, we don't want to do this. And they're like, oh, it's only 5% of our bins anyway. So we'll just you know, take them off before we run the tractor through. Um, and um, the, the feature turned out to be a killer feature. They wouldn't have even considered using us without it. Um, and we had our automation going so that every 11 seconds they pushed a button and a tractor stormed past, tractor with a Ferrari engine and sort of Italian driver who just wants to get out of there. So, um, it was, it was quite cool. Neat. Any other questions? So how, how many people in the room have worked in B2B SaaS before? Yes, yeah, so these are all the people you've triggered the, their PTSD. <laughs> totally. But we broke the rule. We built the thing. Um, was it the right thing? Who knows? <laughs> Over to Michael. Cool. Um, this is a little bit of a dramatic statement. Um, but I've definitely had some realizations um, since moving into ag tech and also the startup world. Um, the first point is that what you think you know, you probably should forget it. Um, and the usual way that we design things and the way we've designed things in the past may not be the best solution for our customers. Um, and this is for a wide variety of reasons, whether it's uh, technical proficiency um, being used to a particular process um, language barriers or the speed in which things ha have to be done, which Aaron kind of alluded to there. Um, but the one thing that does remain true is that simplicity is always best. And if our customers uh, could design our product, it would end up looking something along the lines of this. Um, and you may laugh, uh, but personally, I think it's awesome. Um, <laughs> This type of intuitiveness is something that has always been mentioned in books like The Design of Everyday Things. Um, there's a great quote in there about uh, products that are difficult to use are uh, not faulty, it's just stupid design or something along the lines of that. Um, and it's something that I really believe in as well. We actually got asked when we went to visit a client, they were like, can you not just put a big red button and a big green button on the screen? Why do I have to use these small little buttons? And what they say is 100% true. Um, it would mean that our UI would be much clearer, um, might be a little bit heavy handed, um, but and it might not be the coolest thing, um, and it might be a little bit against the grain, but it would definitely be more usable for our customers, and that's, at the end of the day, what really matters, I guess. And so, <laughs> um, I like this, I'm watching the challenge at the minute, and it's quite relevant. Um, so most fast moving startups uh, will inevitably create um, inconsistencies within the product. And this is true even within huge enterprises out there. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been down the rabbit hole with Amazon trying to you know, get a refund or change your account settings or something. It's like being in different apps every time you click to a new screen. Um, so it's not only startups that have this problem and it's definitely not only us. Um, I've experienced it at every single company I've ever worked for. Um, and this is exacerbated when you're working on different platforms like Android, iOS, um, web portals, our Windows app, things like that. So what we've been doing is building a new platform agnostic design system, which will help our customers use the app easier, um, have better contrast, bigger buttons, things like that. Um, but also regardless of the platform that they're using, be able to help each other when they get run into problems. Um, so that the app is actually similar across the platforms. Um, so to recap, uh, sometimes even common patterns are not fully understood by everyone. Um, what's worked for me and Aaron in products that we use or things that we've worked on in previous companies um, will not necessarily work in the ag tech industry. Um, test everything. So this seems really obvious, um, but you'd be amazed at how many times I've uh, brought a product to test with customers and thought it was shit hot, um, but turns out that they just don't get it or they don't understand the new sort of patterns that we put in place. And we have to basically roll it back to something really, really simple again, um, which brings me on to the second, third point, sorry. Um, just keep it simple. Uh, the best is the most usable. Um, and yeah, pretty is definitely not the best. Um, the best is obviously the most. Oh, here we go. This is the VP of sales at here, by the way. If it's the same Kevin part, the going to have a certain resonance. <laughs> um, the best is the most usable and suitable solution. Um, and then environmental factors. So seeing growers use our product in the field 
and seeing the tablets that they use, seeing the covers that they have on the tablets, the mud on the screen, the sun coming down. Um, you just don't understand how fast that sort of stuff spirals out of control. Um, and that makes accessibility so much more important um, because of those environmental factors. It's really, really hard to see the screens. Um, and even though the lightest gray that's actually technically accessible looks the best, it's definitely not the best in reality um, when you go to watch them using it. And speaking of green and red buttons, <laughs> you can tell them the time is How are we feeling? Good, any questions at this stage? That was a trick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Recruiting for designs. Um, yeah, so the question is, how do we find recruiting for testing our designs? Um, definitely really hard for screen shares. Um, people just aren't keen to spend that time. But what we do is we kind of, well, I'd set you in the next piece of mind, but we sort of bring something along and kind of, you know, ask them. It has to be really simple, and it, you have to make sure it doesn't need internet to work because you're in the middle of a field somewhere. Um, but yeah, just asking them casually when you're with them, could you, do you mind walking through this? And make sure you know what you need to find out from those from that test. Um, but yeah, best. sorry. Best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It works best. Um, trying to organize a call, and also because our designs are our apps are on mobile, that's even harder to get people to use on the web. So you would be talking about tethering a, a phone to a computer, <laughs> and it's just not going to work. But yeah, great question. From the back. Yeah. Right. Um, so we've got offline capability. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's about users that don't have any internet whatsoever, not even satellite. Um, not even satellite's a big one as well. Um, so we have offline capability as well, so people can still enter their stuff, and then it all synchronizes back to the cloud when they get back to an internet connection. Um, but we have uh, recommended Starlink, which has pretty good coverage, you know. Um, but then, you know, maybe maybe there are some parts that don't have satellite as well. But uh, we've recommended Starlink where there's been like a need for strong internet, and um, that's been pretty good. Yeah. I was just going to ask about our context. Um, how big is Hecla in terms of people? And how big is our presence? Yeah. So 50 people ish. Uh, product is two. Me and another person, and designers too, Michael and another person. And we have Sagi here who um, leads us, the zany bunch of us um, over there. So, uh, CPTO. Uh, we've got about 20 engineers, I think. Um, so, 25. 25? <laughs> cool. 25 engineers. So, you might say that outweighs us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they outnumber us. Yeah. Yeah. How cyclical is the growing? How cyclical is the growing season down here uh, compared to, say, the United States? And then what impact does that have on your product roadmap? Yeah, huge. So the question was, oh, no, you've already got the question. Um, the question was how cyclical. Uh, very cyclical, that's the answer. <laughs> uh, our roadmap is entirely driven by um, when a specific cultivar of fruit decides to present itself to the world, uh, which is a crazy thought. Um, the apple season in the US is sort of from August to November. Apple season in New Zealand is from about February to sort of uh, May-ish. Um, and then we've got cherries that kind of happen in between those two things. And there's stone fruit and there's onions and stuff as well. So. Uh, generally, we try and um, hit some sort of feature uh, release before the season starts because if you release a feature, then no one uses it for a year. It gets stale, right? So uh, we try and get that validation from customers and try and hit uh, each important milestone when we can. I'm going to keep going and we can have more questions at the end. Um, oh, yeah, one more. Um, you mentioned before that um you don't have or you've had to learn more about you know you aren't the users and you are learning about how the you know cyclical <laughs> orchard seasons work um how does that impact your um i guess strategy development do you rely more on learning from your users or do you like how do you learn and kind of develop your own kind of strategy as well or do you mostly take it from your users that's a very good question. Do you want to take? No, product product strategy, product strategy. 
<laughs> it's a hard question, so maybe you should take it. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so uh, I had a, a few years of previous experience in pack houses, um, and um, I think one of the only ways to really learn is to be there um, and to observe things happening, um, because um, you can have all your uh, hypotheses you want when you're formulating your strategy, but it means nothing until you validate it with customers. Um, so you've got to actually go there, you've got to see them operating. Uh, it's especially true for you know UX design, right? It might make sense to you, but if they've got to you know they do this thing in this place and they've got to go and like use a special machine over here to get the you know sugar value of the fruit, you know maybe it doesn't make sense to do the things at the same time. You know what I mean? So um, I think um, you know ob observing your customers and being there is really important, but um, but it's also not enough uh, as well. Um, so you need to to keep up to speed with the developments in the industry. A lot of it's competitor research as well. Um, and just subscribing to LinkedIn feeds of people who are doing other innovations in the space. So like Orchard Robotics is a big thing at the moment, um, where they're getting robots to replace pickers. And that's a huge you know, development for us. So keeping tabs on that as well. Um, there are lots of journal articles about how apples you know, evolve over time and when you should pick them and so on. I don't personally read them. I probably should, but um, there's you can go a lot deeper as well. All right, we're going to move to the thing and we'll do more questions at the end. Um, this is another one of those product scenarios that hopefully you love or hate by now. Um, this one came from the CEO this time, so a little different level of person you're talking to at the moment. And it's also backed by sales, so you've basically got no chance whatsoever. But <laughs> we're going to run through the scenario, and you guys are going to vote for your thing. There'll be three questions as well for context, and um, we'll see where everyone lands up. So the CEO and sales reckon this new region, South America, as a huge opportunity. Um, on a sales trip, the sales team discovered we need a feature, which is what sales usually discovers. Uh, we haven't even started building it just yet, and Kevin's on the call as well, so this is awkward. Um, the season is five months away, um, and you need to ship it by that date, otherwise customers get very angry. Um, but sales needs a commitment right now, um, because we need to add local resource, and we need to start signing contracts, which happens much in advance for these enterprise ag tech customers. So, the question is, do you commit or do you refuse? Uh, so it's kind of like the previous one, except on a, on a different scale, really. Um, a little bit of context about this one. Um, we, the cherries, cherries is massive in South America. So we wanted to add, the sales wanted us to add color to our cherries product. We already had color for our apples product, but color for apples is about what percentage of the fruit is red, whereas color for cherries is you know, how red is the fruit. Um, on a scale of like light red to real dark red. So completely different algorithms. Uh, also, they do different containers there. So it's not just a, a, a bin like our machine learning models have been trained with. There's other stuff in the bin. It's in totes inside bins. So some algorithmic complexity there as well. You have three questions as the product manager of there. Do you commit or do you refuse? People are thinking there's a lot on the line. Is uh, localization required? Because South America, Brazilian Portuguese, and then also Spanish, do the products have to be that? Because that can take up a lot of resources. Yeah, hundred percent true. Um, so uh, Chilean Spanish and Argentinian Spanish are also different from each other and um, dialects. Uh, and in, in Brazil, it's different language completely. Portuguese. Luckily, we've got quite a big um, uh, contingent of Spanish speakers in our uh, organization from America, uh, so we could do the sales and support side quite easily. Uh, and fortunately, our, our mobile app had. Um, language support, uh, so that was wasn't an issue for us, but um, you know, still a good consideration. But okay for us. Good question. Second question. Um, what's the estimate market value of this new market in comparison with your existing revenue? I guess. Very, very good. Very good. Do you have any prizes? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring any prizes. Um, you can buy yourself an apple and enjoy how good it is. In fact, it made it so far to you. Um, so uh, yes, huge opportunity. So um, we calculated that the, the market for cherries uh, in Chile is about half as big as the market for apples in the US, which is our big market. So uh, huge, huge market. Third question. And final, I think uh, is there a competitor that could threaten you guys if you don't do it before the season starts? If you waited a year or maybe even two years? Very good question as well. The competitive landscape is, uh, is at the moment quite clear 
in this particular space, but um, there are a whole bunch of new entrants coming in. Uh, we got kind of first mover advantage, I'd say, in this particular thing, um, apart from an old dinosaur company, uh, which I won't name because this is being recorded. Um, but um, competitors are definitely a threat. If we don't capture the market this season um, and demonstrate accuracy and results to the, to the customers, it's very likely we'll lose them forever. Okay, so you have to make a choice. Uh, obviously, you don't get to go back and forth with the sales guy who's on the call. Um, do you commit five months in advance to shipping a feature by a deadline that you haven't even started discovery on yet? Who says they commit? We got about 40%. It's much bigger than last time. <laughs> and what about refuse? And there's a lot of undecided people. There's nothing on the line for you guys. Was <laughs> okay, we got the commits. You hear that, Kevin? You've got some some commitment from product Aotearoa. This is dangerous, man. It's very dangerous. There's a lot of risk. Oh, so I committed again uh, to shipping a feature by a fixed deadline before discovery started. And if you read any product management textbook, this is what you should not do, right? I'm well aware of that. Um, but we will talk about. Oh, I'm talking about it. <laughs> uh, but we will um, talk about what happened. Um, and this is what happened. So uh, we evaluated the feature against strategy again. Uh, is the region strategically uh, important over there? Uh, massive, massive opportunity, and also strategically important for a different reason, which I won't go into at the moment. But uh, very much our target market. Um, is it big enough? It was. Uh, does the feature solve a problem? Does it fit within our product range? Um, we already had color for apples, color for cherries made sense, color for all fruit types kind of makes sense as well, um, because color kind of determines how much you get for the fruit. It determines the price, uh, which so then is very valuable to our customers. Um, and is this opportunity size big enough versus other initiatives in the roadmap? So um, we are going for an A raise soon, uh, which means our valuation now is important which means our revenue now is important. So when I was prioritizing these things, the real question was, can it lead to 2023 revenue? Have you guys ever sort of um, tried to prioritize for revenue now? <laughs> There's very few things that you can sell right now. So uh, that's why it jumped kind of to the top of the priority list. And um, the only question was, can we ship on time, really? Um, and the engineer said, probably. <laughs> Uh, so we did a couple of spikes. Um, we had already done cherries before, so there wasn't too much of a stretch. Um, we also had other plans to do you know, similar things, so we had enough confidence to kind of say yes. Um, and what happens? Sales were amazing. We signed 10 customers, which is huge for us, before the season even started. Um, and we shipped it on time, um, only if you consider the fact that we got help from the weather. And who here can say that they got help from the weather when shipping a software deadline? <laughs> it's weird. Uh, so when the cherry season started, it rained for about three weeks, um, which is crushing for our growers. They lost a lot of money, or the, the early cherries just died. Um, but uh, we managed to ship it the day before they actually started picking. Um, and we pretended we had it all along, obviously. Um, and um, Feedback's been all right so far, but the real test is going to be churn and, and next year retention. So that's what we ended up doing. Um, is it the right thing? Uh, I don't know, but it's what we did. So, go to Michael. Cool. <laughs> this is the last story, <laughs> and then we'll uh, let you guys get back to pizza. Um, so, yeah, this one came as more of a necessity than anything, um, mainly <laughs> down to some of the stories you've all heard from Aaron uh, so far. Um, but we are in a state of con continuous discovery, uh, which calls for us to be doing just enough research um, to be dangerous and move forward with some of our decisions. Um, and yeah, be hashtag agile for once. Um, so yeah, we're probably all very used to seeing this um, in research and people going into our room and locking the door for two or three weeks and then coming out with some findings and then locking the door again and coming back with the report. Um, and that can often take a month or a month and a half or, you know, who knows? Um, and that's a luxury we just don't have. Um, along with that, there's a few common challenges that we have um, to face in our industry. Um, shout out to AI for generating this designer, hiding behind a screen. Um, you really can't do that. And that's, as you had mentioned earlier, how do we test things with people? Um, we have to go out to the field. 
we don't have a script. We can't exactly go out with a test script and, and try and read off it and then have the conversation with them. Um, it just doesn't work. Um, we can't record the conversation um, because we're out in the field and asking them, can you record them, might throw them off a little bit or seem a little bit strange. Um, and we can't easily screen share and test the prototype with someone, record it, look at all the touches, interactions, um, and look back at it later and analyze it for days and, and really um, record it in dovetail, get the sentiment, things like that. Those are luxuries we just don't have. Um, and yeah, we really can't use any transcription tools, which is a nightmare. Um, I've been in the car with Aaron in Canberra and um, <laughs> Tasmania while he furiously types up notes from a meeting. Um, while I drive a very fast car um, around some back streets and back roads in the countryside. Um, and you'd actually be amazed at how, so we had three back-to-back -back orchard visits, and you'd be amazed at how three people can mix up three different visits so much and have so many arguments about what a customer actually said <laughs> after a full day of orchard visits, um, and how three people can understand something incredibly differently. Um, yeah, something to behold. And yeah. Distractions are everywhere and orchards are really, really busy places, whether it's people managing workers and um, avoiding forklifts in the pack house. Usually they're not driven by a dog and um, that was a special occasion um, or just people getting phone calls or things happening and things coming up. Um, you actually won't really get an hour of somebody's time unless um, unless you really plan it in advance um, or just get really lucky that someone doesn't get interrupted. So how have we dealt with these things, I guess? Um, seize any opportunity to talk to your customers, um, even if it's not planned um, or not during an actual research study. Um, know your script off by heart um, so you don't have to bring a document along with you and be able to pivot depending on what they say, obviously. Um, just go where the conversation takes you. Um, make sure you bring a super simple prototype on a few different devices because people use different devices. Um, and do not rely on an internet connection if you're going out to customer sites, um, especially in agriculture. Um, find an errand to do all your notes for you um, while you drive a really fast Cooper. Um, highly recommend it. And make sure you over communicate with your customer in the lead up to a visit. Make sure that you set the expectations of how much time you need, what you're going to be doing, that you want to show them a prototype because um, often they're not prepared for it or they'll only set aside 15, 20 minutes to have a chat with you where you actually need an hour minimum probably. Um, so yeah, really set those expectations. And we've been really lucky to travel around and have all these conversations and meet all these customers in their natural habitat, I guess. Um, so yeah, it's been quite cool, I guess, a different aspect of user testing for us. Uh, so a couple of key takeaways, I guess. Yeah, and we're gonna, between us. Um, so I guess key takeaway story number one is you have to kind of do everything as a product manager because if you miss out on strategy or discovery or delivery, you know, maybe you can leave that to the engineers a little bit and the designers. But um, if you miss one of those aspects, you can build either the wrong product uh, or uh, the, the wrong thing for a customer or you don't ship it uh, on time or it gets too big. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that you need to keep in mind. Um, and if you're not the one doing it, you need someone else to be doing it. Uh, otherwise, you'll be on a slow trudge towards bankruptcy, I suppose. Well, that was a bit dark, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Meant to end on a light note. Um, yeah, a little bit lighter. Embrace the uniqueness of the industry you work in. I did have ag tech in here, but it could be any industry. You probably all work in a bunch of different industries. So really embrace it and um, lean into the way they do things. And, and yeah, you can't really go far wrong. And I highly recommend going actually visiting them on site um, yeah four years or something during COVID we didn't visit a single customer um, and yeah now after they doing it for a few months it's just so refreshing and you get to see them actually go through some struggles and um, not just an hour phone call I guess cool controversial hot take number three um, sometimes maybe you should build what the customer wants um, and uh, you're told that you shouldn't all the time but I think sometimes maybe you should. And I don't think like if you're in a B2C organization, like you go back and say, oh, Aaron from Hector said that we should build what customers want and then start prioritizing things based on who, you know, the thing. But uh, at least, um, at least a, a sale is validation that someone will pay for it, right? Which is a lot more than 
nine of the other 10 ideas that you'll come with, up with as a discovery team. So um, you shouldn't build it how the customer wants you to build it. Uh, and you shouldn't build something that doesn't fit in with your strategy. Um, and um, you need to be very deliberate about what your strategy is. But a customer saying they want something isn't necessarily grounds for saying it's a stupid idea. That's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> I feel like mine are a lot less hot takes than yours. <laughs> um, yeah, so just to recap on the, the number four there, um, always think about where your product will be used and who will be using it. So that might seem pretty obvious, but yeah, just think about the other stresses that they've gone on in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, think about the whole journey of them using the app. Think about the environment that they're in, the other distractions that they have going on, the fact that there's sunlight or dirt all over the things they're using. Um, yeah, these things can actually really impact how they're using it and what they're um, psyche is like <laughs> i guess uh, as they're using your product and um, it can impact their actual behaviors as well cool uh also very controversial sales and cs aren't the enemy um believe it or not like you're told in the in the uh, product management textbooks um i am a big believer in product management textbooks by the way um and if you asked me nine months ago what the right answers were i would be shocked at even the fact that i thought this in the future um, but uh, I'm very lucky at Hector to have a really nice uh, leadership team and we have very robust conversations between sales and product, between CS and product. Uh, and CS feel very passionately about all the bugs that our product has, which are going to lead to churn. Sales feels very passionately about getting their commissions, you know. So you need to <laughs> you need to listen because they're the people who are going to be fronting up and trying to sell the thing. And they've got some good instincts about what's going to sell and what's not going to sell. So that doesn't mean that you should listen to all listen to them all the time but um definitely take them seriously that's my, my plea <laughs> to you uh, and um, i think it all comes down to revenue at the end of the day so we're all kind of arguing about pathways to revenue whether it's current revenue which sales will be biased towards uh, churn reduction which cs will be biased towards um all kind of strategy and, and future kind of hockey stick revenue which we might be biased towards everyone's on the same team when it comes to earning revenue over the long term so um, if you have the conversations about when we should get that revenue, um, then that's a good conversation to have. Yeah, and finally, um, discovery and research doesn't always need to be so rigid or follow some exhaustive framework and you need to do every single thing along the, along the journey. Um, just do enough to make a decision and move forward and, and understand your customers better. Um, that's a really good book. Um, I don't have time to explain it, <laughs> but um, yeah. Check it out if you haven't read it before. If you have, read it again. It's awesome. Cool. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on at Hectare. Um, so we are a pre-A startup at the moment. Um, we are, I'm really jazzed about what we're doing in the world at the moment, trying to increase fresh produce, making it to consumers. Um, we have pretty strong revenue growth as well this year, thanks to you know listening to sales all the time, I suppose. Um, not all the time. Uh, we've got customers in 15 countries across four continents, uh, a few different languages. Um, we, trust me, these are the exceptions. We have a focus on good product practice, um, and uh, we've got solid product leadership in Sagi as well, someone who's friendly to, to product, uh, doing product well. Um, and um, as soon as we land our Series A raise, um, which is a variable quantity, as many of you all know, uh, we might be looking to expand. So if you're interested in having a chat, reach out. and. Um, you can talk to either Sagi or Michael or me uh, or Somya or Navitha as well if you know them. So reach out. Um, I asked um, AI to, to do thank you in fruit. Uh, AI is oppressive, but it's a terrible speller. <laughs> I don't think it got thank right once. And you was, it, maybe it, it's like not able to talk to us directly. Or like it has to use like a, an honorific or something. I don't know, but it's terrible. This one was my favorite down here, thank you. That was the kind of the closest that it got. Um, and also there's kind of a hidden chestnut in here. Uh, yeah. so, so AI. Uh, any questions? Right, also questions. Um, by the way, if you're uh, online, um, please type your question into the chat and we'll pull it from there. Um, and please guys remember to re repeat the question. Yeah, if you just yell it out, I'll repeat it back. Um, hi, hi. Uh, my name is Vichara. So this sparked my curiosity. Like 10 years back, I was working with a high-end cell code, and we had a product, where IoT-based product, where we could implement it in orchards and then help them make a decision when the food is right for picking, et cetera, and all those things. 
Um, but it wasn't feasible to be very honest at the time. Uh, I know a lot of things have changed in 10 years and you guys look like you've been expert in this field. So what's your current um, um, reading on those things? Are, is a, in the current world, are those things still happening? Are they become feasible? Do you interact with those kind of um, IoT setups, um, software uh, with the implementation of what's yeah, good question. So the question was, I used to work at a telecommunication company. We were doing IoT to, to predict pick date, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Who and a lot of Yeah. And uh, is there a lot of activity in that space amongst other companies? Yeah. First of all, you should stop doing that. That's not very interesting. Uh, leave it to us. Um, <laughs> but, um, there are a lot of people in the space. Um, so IoT is very big in the orchards as well. There's, there's good tech adoption there. Um, they currently do things. I think this is the, like, the job to be done principle, like your competition, the, the problem is already solved by something else. Um, and what that something else is, is cutting fruit up and then having a look and measuring how much starch is in the fruit and squashing it and measuring how much sugar is in the fruit and then making some sort of multifactorial decision in the head of an orchard manager uh, before you decide which of the blocks you want to pick based on you know what you know pickers you've got uh, available to you uh, how many you can pick in parallel there's a whole bunch of different factors uh, and people are solving those problems um, one after the other in the orchard we're not solving that particular problem but there are so many problems to solve um, and it's a huge science aspect so it's more solved in the warehouse than the orchard uh, both the warehouses are just going crazy um, with automation um, they're just trying to get rid of all the people in the in the warehouses, the pack houses. So, yeah, automation in the orchards with sort of machines that will drive up and pick fruit automatically and size them and so on as well, uh, and also machines in the, in the pack house. So, no shortage of tech, drones, you know, you name it. A question, question on the on the phone uh, from Lydia. Uh, where do you get your ideas for new features from, other than sales and the CEO? <laughs> That's where all feature ideas come from, isn't it? <laughs> no, I think it's um I think it's really important to have a, a solid strategy, um, and uh, what that means is kind of predicting what your customers want and what's valuable to them, um, and then kind of figuring out how you fit into creating value for them. Um, so we've um, got a new strategy um, around you know making more money for our customers because you know i believe that if you can make customers money then they're going to pay you for the things that they want uh actix quite saturated as well so um they they've bought billions of technologies in the past and, and then like stopped adopting them um so i guess the point is they're kind of a bit gun shy um, and you really need to demonstrate roi so um i think a good place to start is you know surveying the competitive landscape uh, with the market segment and the geographies that you want to go into uh, finding out what the competition is there, thinking about what cust what's valuable to customers in those spaces, um, and then coming up with some sort of competitive advantage to differentiate yourself against all the other people who are trying to capture that market share. Um, and then once you've got that idea about how you're going to create that competitive advantage, then you can start to build sort of features that head you towards that point. So uh, strategy is the answer, I guess. And I suppose as well, we don't just go out test things with customers and we don't just do evaluative research we also go out and do generative research and try and understand the problems that they're having that also feeds into our roadmap as well so yeah it does come from research as well as ceo and sales and things like that <laughs> thankfully hey uh, given the short picking window um, that many of your customers experience can you tell us a little bit about your revenue model i'm assuming it's some kind of subscription but it's probably not annual so are you able to be creative and strategic and offer something unique around subscriptions and revenue and what does that look like? Yeah, um, so we do have an annual subscription model um, and even though they only use it for a, a couple of months in the year to pick, um, they're also using it, uh, the orchard one, uh, to manage pruning and thinning and all sorts of other actions and labour within the orchard. Um, so there is an all year round service. Um, there is a spike in support needs uh, during that picking window, obviously. Um, but um, we do charge an annual subscription. Um, and because we've got customers of varying sizes, we tend to make it about how big their farm is. So that's, yeah. Uh, I think you had a question before. Uh, I'm hoping there was a bit of a... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see your hand earlier. I'm hoping there was a bit of a friend's reference throughout that presentation. Um, what's been your biggest Joey moment? 
and what did you learn from it? <laughs> How would you define a joy moment? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, myself and Aaron have a really weird sense of humor. So when we're on the road, and this is actually answering this question as well, um, we do a bunch of international visits. We were in Tasmania and Aaron and a few guys were in America as well. So we spend a lot of time on the road together. Um, and yeah, the conversations that aren't about work become very dumb very quick. And yeah, so there's a lot of laughs. Um, but yeah, can't say there's any professionally. <laughs> Aaron might be able to think of a few. Oh, no, I tend not to make mistakes. <laughs> so, uh, um, no, but uh, every time you visit a customer, um, they are 20 years into the industry. Um, and what Michael said was, was really true. They expect you to know everything, right? They're giving you their precious money uh, which they don't have very much of at the moment. Growers are kind of uh, going bankrupt, bankrupt en masse. Um, they expect you to know it, right? Um, so if you don't know the thing that they're talking about, <laughs> you kind of, which is often, um, you just kind of fake your way through it, really, and just be like, oh yeah, that's interesting, and then do some googling after. Mm -hmm. um, or if you know it feels like a good relationship, you might kind of ask them as it goes. But plenty of joy moments talking to customers. But I think that's how you learn as well. So. Yeah. Um, you mentioned before how ROI is so important especially in agriculture. Um, have you had or faced any challenges with the ROI for your product so far? And if so, how did you deal with them? Oh, another good question. Um, <laughs> um, I think uh, there, was, there was a project, since we're talking about all of my kind of failings as a product manager. Um, so uh, there was one, um, where we we wanted to hit the start of the season i kind of alluded to it as well in the in the scenario at the beginning um and we thought um if we build this thing um then we can make all the customers who've only bought size by color as well so we had a, a business case attached to that um but due to delays and, and so on um we didn't ship it until the end of the season and we missed that opportunity for revenue so um i guess the roi wasn't there for that um, but that particular feature was a foundation to build on another feature which we think will uh, provide uh, upsell potential. Uh, and it also was crucial in landing that market um, that we ended up landing. So there was an ROI to it, but it wasn't what we expected. Um, and hopefully next year we can capture that money again. But usually like straight after the picking season, everyone goes on holiday. You don't hear from your customers for a couple of months. And then you get the kind of full-time workers who are, who are running the orchards and uh, they don't really want to talk about buying things until, you know, uh, the year later. Hmm. Um, how are you addressing the algorithmic bias of the engineers? The algorithmic bias of our engineers? Yeah. Like, everyone is biased. So what you do is you're consuming a whole lot of data. Mm -hmm. So that if it's constructed in a particular way, it's just flawed as the metrics that you're pulling from it, you can't reuse. That's a good question. So the first half of the question was about algorithmic bias and how do we uh, fight against algorithmic bias in our engineers. Um, I always feel fortunate that we're in fruit um, and not in, uh, my previous startup was in healthcare, uh, which is, um, you know, the, the bias that creeps in is, can be quite discriminatory and harmful. Um, but uh, if we're more biased towards like elongated apples versus you know shorter apples, then uh, it just means that we can't do specific varieties or the accuracy is a little bit worse in some circumstances. Um, so uh, I think we have less problems with with bias and it's more about kind of overall accuracy. And then there's a trade-off between you know how many fruit types do we support? Uh, for unlocking market access versus what's our accuracy and how likely is it that computers are going to kind of catch up and start taking our customers. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> okay, it sounds good. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm just making an <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my question is, uh, do you consider partnerships, strategic partnerships, or integration with other, uh, I guess, companies who are solving problems on the farm or in the orchards as well? Because obviously this is a fantastic product, but there are other issues like you mentioned before. And and how do you con like do you consider that kind of as as part of your product roadmap kind of thing as well? Yeah, hundred um, percent. So. It's all about partnerships, I think, in ag tech, because there are so many other companies that are doing something so specific in the orchard. Um, and you really have to choose early on, which things are we gonna try and do versus which things are we gonna try and partner with? So that build by partner 
uh, conversation is really important for us. Um, in the, the second example where we shipped automation, uh, one of the trial customers, we launched a partnership with uh, another company that did sort of quality control inventory management. Um, and they did the integration for free for our mutual customer on the grounds that we'd expand um, elsewhere. So it's always on our mind. Um, but that decision about who you partner with and, and what you build yourself is is really tough because if you do a partnership, then you know you have to, I guess, stop developing in that region unless you want to kind of undercut them deliberately. But um, there has to be like a, a mutual interest. Um, it's tough. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. Um, you mentioned you guys are dealing with a lot of accessibility issues. Can you just talk a bit about more about that? How are you dealing with that? Um, yeah, so at the minute, one of our big things is contrast. Um, that's the biggest ticket on the on the agenda. Um, it's just, I guess, with the speed of things over the past couple of years, it's not been something that's been top of mind. But as we do more and more research, we really lean into it. We're seeing that it's become, it is a massive problem. Um, and it's not just for people with disabilities, it's for everybody because of those environmental factors that I mentioned and things like that. Um, but I mean, we will have to consider things like screen readers and um, stuff like that as well as we go forward. Um, it's not built for that at the minute and probably because you know people with disabilities don't work in the field or things like that, but we're going to see more of that. Um, as we go forward and people become more progressive in agriculture as well. Um, so yeah, definitely first ticket is um, accessibility and we're doing that via the design system. So everything has to pass a certain threshold of uh, contrast and then and then we'll move forward from there. Do you, do, do you go externally to, to get some advice on it or are you just kind of like building the knowledge inside? No, not yet. No, no, we haven't done anything like that. I know we've, I did one in my previous company and they had a massive report and I think if we did that right now, we'd be swamped in, <laughs> in backlog. So um, yeah, there will be a time and a place for that. But um, at the minute, we're just working on the expertise we have. We have some really passionate developers who care about this sort of thing as well. Um, and I know the design team and the product team are really passionate about, about doing better in that field. So yeah, just working on our own <laughs> expertise at the minute. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. That was the next hand that I saw. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, you've spoken a bit about uh, having a great CS and sales team, and uh, I know they can also be a really valuable source of empathy for the customers and product ideas. Have you found good ways that are constructive to harness those ideas? And if so, do you mind sharing in terms of how you prioritize um, or how you? Um, yeah, I guess how you collate those ideas in clever ways. Mm. Three aspects uh, of an answer, so I don't forget them. Uh, the first thing is just classic bug reporting. Um, we've got lots of Slack integrations so that um, bugs kind of come through from CS um, and then they can be, you know, they've got a ticket in Jira and we can kind of have a look at the details. Uh, we're very big on fixing bugs. Um, so. Like products not usually involved so they just go straight to the engineers the engineers will fix it and then that bug will be gone forever if it's bigger then they might you know come to me and ask should we prioritize this or not uh, but usually the vast majority just fix it straight away um second thing we um uh i kind of felt that there was a, a misalignment that we we're out of sync with each other so every wednesday uh, for half an hour we get sales and cs all of us on a single call because we're quite a small startup still uh, and we just talk about the experiences that we've had with with customers. Uh, usually turns into like a whole bunch of feature requests from sales and CS. But you know we listen to it because that's what you know we're here to do. It's our job, um, and um, that has kind of helped break down those barriers. Um, and the third thing, uh, really early in the design process, uh, we'll get uh, a CS rep involved as well, um, and to, to brainstorm just the initial like blue sky solution ideas to the the problems that we've identified, um, and um, just to make sure that we've got a good understanding for what the problems are, whether they can think of any edge cases, different customers. Um, and um, we, on the go-to-market side as well, so we release things uh, in a beta capacity, and then CES kind of leads a phased release with friends, friendly customers. Um, and then that kind of informs our early bug fixes, and then we do like a big launch after that. So lots of involvement with CES. Um, yeah, we use them as a stepping stone towards research, I think, because, you know, as we mentioned, we need to, know what we're talking about when we go into these conversations especially research so yeah they're so helpful for us to know what we're talking about when we start those conversations 
So we're not coming in and asking them all the same questions that they've already told CS and probably already told someone else before that. Yeah. Okay, running a little bit over time, so just one last question um, from me, which is um, the examples that you gave during the talk and, and that you, you, you so wonderfully triggered all our PTSD with, um, if the company had been at a different stage, do you think you would have made a different decision? Uh, almost certainly. Um, and um, I think the reason is because of the business outcome we're shooting towards for the prioritization. Um, as I mentioned, we're going for an A raise. Uh, revenue now is important because uh, revenue valuations are usually a multiple of your revenue. So the more revenue we can get this year, um, the better. So. Uh, if we were post day, uh, we might be investing more on our Horizon 2 or Horizon 3 initiatives. But for right now, it's what's going to get us money right now. And then sales and, and product are quite aligned in that in that mode of operating, right? Because they want short-term revenue to get their commissions and you want short-term revenue as well so that the business can achieve their outcomes. Um, fast forward to next year, maybe we'll have a lot of tension between sales and product. Um, but um, revenue is still important though, and you have to get that growth. So. I see it's an opportunity for a follow-up talk in, in six or twelve months' time to see how see how it's going. <laughs> All right, massive, massive round of applause and thanks, Sarah and Michael.